This will determine what America is going to look like for a long, long time. Yes, it is. Character is on the ballot. Compassion is on the ballot. Decency, science, democracy. They're all on the ballot. Who we are as a nation, what we stand for, and most importantly, who we want to be. That's all on the ballot. And the choice could not be more clear. Good afternoon and welcome to Washington Post Live's Race in America series. I'm Robin Gibbon and I'm pleased to welcome Will I Am. Will is a musician, philanthropist, tech entrepreneur, and also, of course, the head of the iconic hip hop group, uh, the Black Eyed Peas. He has been very busy during uh, this period of lockdown and quarantining in London. Uh, co-hosting the UK version of The Voice. Uh, he also has been deeply involved with his foundation, with, which supports uh, 750 young people, uh, making sure that they have access to food and education. And he also uh, just released a video uh, that celebrates unity and speaks to the importance of uh, love and also voting. It's my pleasure to welcome Will I Am. Hello, Robin. Hi, how are you? I'm okay. Um, just uh, trying to control my anxiety from, you know, waiting for the outcome on Tuesday. But I other than that. Everyone, everyone has to breathe. Just breathe. Just breathe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, we will start there. Um, I mean, you, I, I'm wondering when you decided to uh, make this video, was it a little bit of just sort of working through some of that anxiety? What sparked the idea? I just didn't want to have regrets. Like I wish I did something. I didn't want to, you know, wake up one day wishing that I, tried my hardest to inspire, tried my hardest to unite the divided, tried my hardest to remind us, you know, the simplicity of what is being asked, and that is to activate yourself and vote for a different version of what we have right now. I didn't want to wake up one day and say, dang, the past four years were tough, but damn, that the last nine months were freaking extreme. You know, so many family members have lost loved ones. So many people have no jobs. So many people are, are facing eviction because they can't pay their bills because of the way we handled COVID, right? The compound effect. And yeah, you know, it's, we are all in this conundrum. We are all stuck in this ditch. And the person that's, that's driving the vehicle doesn't want to take accountability. And then you have the folks that are supporting them for whatever reason. Whatever reason their phone is telling them that he's doing a great job. Um, my phone is telling me that he's not. But not just my phone. Reality is telling me that he's not. We can't do stuff is telling me that he's not. People don't have jobs is telling me that he's not. So I'm looking at reality more so than the uh, conflicted compromise device that's given me and feeding me news, this isolated bubbleism that we all live in. But then there's reality and the freedoms that have been compromised are uh, our right to assemble because of COVID, people dying because of COVID. Uh, um, like I said, before I repeat, uh, people have lost their jobs and can't pay their bills because of COVID. And we are in the situation, the worst nation, 
we're, we're we should be the we should be leading in how we've handled it. We shouldn't have the most cases and the most deaths. We should not have you know the most folks laid off of work. That shouldn't be our tale. That shouldn't be you know our stats as a, as proud Americans, the leaders of the world. Like that shouldn't be what we you know, our claim. But that is reality. You know, we've been hooping and hollering that, you know, we, or our gates are, are are the pearly gates. But now the whole world has closed their gates on us. And the only place that we can travel to is the is the place that we try to put up walls. Mexico is the only place we could go to. And so thank you, Mexico, for an open mind, for an open, <laughs> an open heart and an open mind. <laughs> You know, yeah. one of the one of the things that you have have mentioned in earlier interviews is that uh, as a young man, uh, you really, you know, you didn't feel that your vote uh, really mattered, that it would have a, a, a significant impact. But clearly, you know, that has changed, and you know, this election um, has seemed to early indicators suggest that younger people really are stepping up and, and voting. I'm curious what what along the way sort of sparked that fire in you that made you say, yeah, my vote does matter and I really need to use it. Was there some precipitating event or some moment? Yeah, 2003, the Black Eyed Peas, sorry, if I go back, in 2001, September the 12th, Black Eyed Peas, we went on tour on that day, the day after September 11th. Mm. And I remember what it, what the configuration was going to the airport and my mom and my grandma, my whole entire family walked me to the gate. And then after 9-11, you know, we had to nearly take off all our clothes and no one could go to the gate anymore. I saw, you know, the precautions we took to keep our nation safe. Um, and then we, uh, you know, we went to war with a nation um, with, the, with the misinformation that they had weapons of mass destruction. And, and we, we attacked the wrong people. We retaliated against the wrong folks. And then when it was time to vote in 2004, I, I shot up. I, I voted. And I campaigned and campaigned and we went on, it started when we were on the Grammys, performing Words of Love, and something told me to, to say, make sure you vote. That was the, I remember that. I was like, I don't know what it was that told me to, after we played the Grammys, to say, go out and vote. Um, and that was the fire that I had in my gut. And then from there, I've, I've, I've been activated. I didn't really, I didn't, I don't remember voting in, in 1999 when Al Gore was running against Bush. I don't, I don't, I don't think I voted that, that, that year, yeah. but I definitely yeah. voted in 2004. And I remember telling Carrie, Hey, I want to make a song for you. And he says, yeah, Quincy Jones is going to do that. And I felt, I shrunk. <laughs> I, was, I shrunk. And I, and then, um, in 2008, I was like, I'm not going to let myself get, I'm not going to let myself get deflated, deflated. So I did it independently. I didn't ask the campaign. I just did. Yes, we can to try to motivate and uh, inspire. And in 2020, I'm like, and I campaigned in 2012, went on the campaign trail with Obama. Um, and in 2020, I was trying to find the light. I was trying to find, you know, the spark. And then uh, Biden's speech at the DNC, speaking of light, um, was, that was my spark. And I realized that that speech and that sentiment married the lyrics that we have in Where's the Love. And so I quickly rushed to the studio to, to marry the two. You know, it's interesting because in that speech, Biden talks about uh, Charlottesville and the images that he saw uh, on the on the streets in Charlottesville and how that motivated him to uh, decide to run. I, I'm wondering, when you think back on that moment, what what was going through your mind? Was that an equally um, pivotal moment for you as well? 
You know, I'm in I'm in the UK right now. In the UK, they have peaceful protests. They well, at least they start off that way. And they go to Trafalgar Square and they have one one day dedicated to one side and then the next day they have another protest dedicated to the other side. And every once in a while, you know, there's some tension, but they do a really good job with their protesting here in the UK. Uh, and then we had what we had in, in Charlottesville, what we saw. And the part that really hurt, I, I, don't, I don't even want to give them power. It didn't hurt. What was concerning was the tiki torches. That part was like, wait, wait a sec. What? type of symbology, what what the hell is going on here? And it's one thing to, to protest and you have your posters, but the tiki torches, we know what that means symbolically. Like if this was a movie, we know what that means. And and what, seen, what specifically did that mean to, to you? What? What did what, that mean? What that, did those torches mean to you? It means what it is what it always have meant is that my grandma experienced that. My grandmother's mom experienced that. My uh, the freedom fighters experienced that. Mm -hmm. It's uh symbolic and it's you know, the desire to keep those that are oppressed smushed. It's the devaluing of community, a specific community, that community being ours, Black people, Latinos, immigrants, natives, indigenous. We know what that means. We know what white supremacist means. And we know the symbols that, that are associated with that hoods and torches and burning crosses. The only thing that was missing from that is the hoods and the burning crosses. But you know what that tiki torch means. It wasn't like, oh, because it's dark. It's 20 fucking 20. I'm sorry for cursing. Like, it, why'd you eat up some goddamn tiki torches? Why not flash flashlights? Why the tiki torches? Right. We, we, we know the symbology. Like, let's not pretend like we're not educated enough on the simplest of things like tiki torches. So, and the folks that saw that knew what that mean, meant. Message received. Right? It's like, what a, what a fire emoji means in a text. You know what that means. That's excitement. That's like, I like it. You know what the thumbs up means. We know what thumbs down means. And we know what tiki torches mean. How was it to experience that devastating moment in your country's history from from a distance? You know, seeing it from outside of you know your home. No, at that moment I was home. You were home. I was home when I saw that, and uh, and in the car that killed that young woman on the streets and just crashing through a crowd of people. And then the president saying there were peaceful people, good people on both sides, like doesn't even have the courage and the decency to condemn that hate. That's, that's and, unfortunate. And in your in, in the song that you chose, I mean it, it obviously I mean it speaks about love, but it also, you know, is not purely a kind of warm and fuzzy love. It's it's love as a point of, of action and love as as a form of activism. And you quote um, I believe uh, Cornell West in, in the in the start talking about love being sort of a the uh, justice, love and justice being related. I can't quite remember the exact wording. You probably certainly do. But is that the way that you sort of think of love as not something that is 
um, you know, at rest, but something that is really about action? Love is GPS. Love is coordinates. You know, if, if I'm on my way to money, I need to be directed by love. Because if I'm not directed by love on my way to money, then I'm going to be inhumane to society and people. I'm going to hold money over people, profit over people. If I don't have love as a GPS, if I'm not governing with love first, then I'm going to allow that. If government doesn't have love as a GPS, then, you know, corporations and lobbyists can manipulate governance and people in government. Right, you cannot have you can't have love for the community and then get your community sick by allowing certain foods to be in it. You cannot have love for the community and not have love as GPS to make sure that people in the community are educated and prepared to not only create jobs, I mean fill jobs but create jobs. You cannot govern without love in your heart. You can't only think about Wall Street if you're not thinking about the neighborhood Main Street. You cannot, you can't do that. And why do we allow our society to be, to be led by folks that don't truly have love in their heart? And I know that sounds like kumbaya um, and get along gang and, and warm and fuzzy. And, um, but it, it's a, it should be the guiding principles of folks that we have in office. You can't have police officers patrolling the community and they hate the community and don't understand the conditions of the community. That is a recipe for disaster. So police reform is when officers are patrolling that love the community and understand the conditions and know how to work through turmoil and problems without pulling a weapon to exterminate. That is what we are dealing with right now, where parents are afraid of their kids going out and instead of them being worried about the robbers, they tripping on the cops. That, 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 that's a hell, that's a hellish reality. And why, and what did, what did people have, what did they do to deserve uh, that configuration? It shouldn't be that way. I mean, and, and so much of the, your activism, you're, you're very focused on just sort of the fundamental issue of equality and, um, you know, reaching back to uh, underserved communities as you think about um, how, uh, where we are now, and then also moving forward, um, do you have an extra bit of hope or enthusiasm because of the president's presence of Kamala Harris on, on the Biden ticket? Um, and then I also want to quickly ask you also about sort of science and engineering and all that good stuff. <laughs> I could couple my answer in, in, in that in that. I could I could couple my enthusiasm on Biden and Harris. And I can exhale and not have to worry about leadership that's a you know, a narcissist that doesn't really care about the disenfranchised and the folks that are struggling. At the core, it may, it may, there's an illusion that he cares because it's like a couple of days away from election. We know that's a lie. Just like we knew that Mexico was going to pay for a wall was a lie. But that's what he had to say to his base to get elected. We can't afford that because from 2024 to 2030, it's tough. If people are, have lost jobs now because of COVID, um, jobs are going to leave. It's inevitable. With the, with the rate that technology is going, you know, if you're a truck driver and a fleet of autonomous vehicles come, they ain't going to be truck drivers. If you're an Uber driver and all the knowledge that Tesla cars and Mercedes cars and the uh, electronic self-driving cars that we have now, the basic stuff that's teaching the car, you probably ain't going to be an Uber driver 2026. So do you if see this here, moment with the pandemic as being uh, essentially transformative in terms of what our econ what economies will look like, what jobs will look like? 
on the other side, which obviously, you know, sort of leads into your emphasis on uh, education in, in science and, and technology and engineering and, and the arts as well. It's inevitable that technology will, you know, render certain jobs obsolete. But it's also inevitable that you, if you inspire, mentor, prepare, educate, and support the youth, they will create jobs that we couldn't even imagine right now. And that's the thing that we're not talking about as a nation. We're too divided to even be having that conversation. We're too distracted to, to have our kids focus. Kids can't even go to freaking school right now. There's kids that, are, that can't even learn at home because they don't got Wi-Fi. We can't even have those conversations because the way we've handled the pandemic. And if that's the way that we got here, then we need to back up out of this dead end and get the driver out of the driver's seat because we know who's driving the car. You know, and 2024, we can't afford homie in the seat right now to take us to 2024. That is going to be the worst thing America is going to have to pick its pick its pick itself up from come 2024 if we have another four years of this. You know what it's going to look like from 2020 to 2024? It's going to look like what March to now looks like. Because he refuses to be led and, and um, to, to be led by scientists. He refuses to take the advice of our intelligence um, folks. And so why do we want to have a leader that is ignorant from getting professional assistance from folks that are dedicated in those positions? And where is he getting his information do from? A, do you have a game plan for yourself uh, and for the things that you have been focused on that is that moves forward irregardless of who wins the election? For the past 11 years, I've had my school. I started off with 65 kids. Um, and now I have some 150 kids and we keep growing. And I don't do it for, you know, a photo op. I'm not doing it to like, for, for goody points. I'm doing it because that's where my passion and my heart's at. Whether people know about it or not, I still do it. Um, and I'm proud of our kids that have dedicated themselves and advanced in computer science and robotics and now going to schools like Brown and Dartmouth and Stanford. Uh, for engineering and and robot uh, robotics, and what am, what am I going to do? I'm going to continue to do my part because there's kids in my community that want to join the program because we've proven success. A hundred percent of our kids graduate, a hundred percent, and seventy percent of which go to school for a STEM skill set, and you know, and it works. Um, and we're going to continue to grow. And that's why I'm passionate about preparing kids for tomorrow. These are not like sound bites that, that, you know, Biden campaign told me to say, I see who can help, you know, our program scale. And it's Biden Harris, right? Mm -hmm. Trump's famous. He, he knows celebrities. He knows like. You would have thought like, he's like, hey, Will, I like what you're doing in your neighborhood. That didn't happen in the past four years that he was, that he's been president, right? Are you, are you, and he's, are you distressed he's a, when you see celebrities who do have these ideas about how they, you know, would like to contribute to economic revival and so forth, um, aligning themselves with, with the president? What was that question again? I'm sorry. It was a. Uh, I'm wondering uh, if you if you have concerns about those, uh, you know, people in the public eye, celebrities who have interests in improving economic conditions within Black and Brown communities, um, who who do who have aligned themselves uh, with with the current president and do seem to have faith uh, that he will stand behind what he's saying to them currently. 
people like Ice Cube, for example. Ice Cube is the only um, is the only person that is trying to. His contract with Black America. I see. I see. I understand what he's trying to do, and he's just trying to align himself with whoever is going to, you know, execute the vision for the community. And you know, I salute Ice Cube for that. My only problem with that is he's forgetting that he's a liar. He's forgetting that he's a used uh, uh, a, a car salesman. He's forgetting he's full of shit. And he's forgetting that everything that he said, he's went back on. He's forgetting that he promised, you know, um, his base in 2016 that he was going to build the wall. He's forgetting that he promised that he was going to have Mexico pay for that wall. He's forgetting that he's a lying bag of shit. But other than that, you know, I support Ice Cube. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I just I don't know how to say it. <laughs> Listen, I'm I like I do music, and from that I was able to move my mom out the projects, and for that I was able to like to start my foundation and go back to the projects, and for that like I have my kids, and I'm, and I and I realize that I don't necessarily yeah, and I pay my taxes, and I should pay my taxes because at some point in time in the past, my family was on welfare. And now that I can, I should, and I am, and I will continue to without having a bicker um, about paying taxes. But, uh, if that's what I, okay, I have to do that too. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, thank the Lord that I still have success to be able to worry about that because there's people that don't even have that luxury to worry about that. So I'm, I, I'm blessed. And if that's what I have to do, like somebody did in the past for us to have our comforts being on welfare, cool. That is my karma, and that is what I have to do, and I'm going to do that. And I'll do even more by do, having my school there. And that's awesome that what Ice Cube's trying to do with the, the contract with Black America. Just don't fall for the trickery. Like, I, I look up to Ice Cube, but I always have. But damn, bro, this dude can't be trusted. Well, we only we only have a, a couple of minutes, but I did want to to ask you whether or not you how are whether you feel like um, you know sort of the the population that you've been really trying to speak to uh, with your foundation, young black and brown, particularly young men. Do you do you feel like the president is you know is is attracting their support? I mean, there's been some conversation about that. And I'm wondering if you feel like there's any sort of, sort of truth to that in your estimation. Most of the people that I that I that I see hop in the bandwagon is tax base. Um, it's about it's, money. It's about money. It's not about decency. It's not about preparation for tomorrow. Um, you know, that's what I see. And they, and they're believing the lies and the shenanigans that he, and his promises, his empty promises, um, and his tall claims of, uh, you know, how, how great he is and comparing himself to Abraham Lincoln. He's the greatest president to the back black community since Abraham Lincoln, because Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves and his connection with freeing prisoners means that he sees the black community still as slaves and I will free you. Get out of here with that, bro. No, no, no. You have no clue how great the black community is to compare yourself to Abraham Lincoln. It's a different black community right now. You're not freeing us. We, what are you talking about? That's an insult. And so for people not to see the double speak in that, that's, he's double speaking. But the last thing I, I would just ask you is whether or not you are feeling um, hopeful in this moment. Um, I don't know if you've been talking it to any uh, uh, black women, sort of the, the, the big voters 
uh, out there and whether or not you're getting a sense of optimism and possibility from them. So here's where I'm super hopeful and super excited. Kamala Harris is step number two to the first step that Obama was able to crack the door open for the black community, being the first black president. And because of that, here comes Kamala Harris, the first you know, black female vice president. That's like one, two. So from that, how we progress and how our community continues to rise up, I'm super hopeful. For the folks that are short-minded and short-sighted, like Obama didn't do nothing, they're not seeing the greater door bust down that he's done for our community. To even have a Kamala Harris to follow up with the two punch. Um, I'm super hopeful that we could get back on path, but I'm also in reality. And that is the choices that we have come Tuesday is hard and extremely M and F and hard. I'd rather take hard over extremely M and F and hard. The Trump path is an extreme M and F and hard obstacle that we have if we reelect them. Kamala Harris and Biden is go it's going to be hard no matter how which way we go. Just one is extremely hard, and that will be the Trump path. All right, we will leave it there. I so appreciate your being here. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I will also invite folks to uh, please stay with us during election week when every day at 1 p.m. my colleague Bob Costa will uh, bring you the latest in election coverage and stick around this afternoon because at 4.30 my colleague David Ignatius will be speaking to two of the experts who are featured in the documentary Virus Hunters. And, and thank you very much for being with us.